I certainly we're on just like this on Zoom calls uh, almost on a daily basis. And uh, we have, um, I have five songs completed for drums and we're working on four, we have nine songs total. Four other songs were in various stages of completion for arranging the songs. P pause so for a second. I think there was a delay on going live. So once again, we're on the metal voice. Our guest, Sean Drover, fellow Montrealer, <laughs> uh, ex-Megadeth and uh, currently withering scorn. So please repeat that. Go ahead. Yes, good to see you guys as always. Uh, yeah, right now we're, we're uh, way into uh, the writing and recording of our second Withering Spawn record and things are going great. And uh, just kind of like we are here, I'm, I'm on a Zoom or, or Facebook video almost daily with my brother working on stuff and uh, things are going very well. We're very excited about it, very excited. But that's not why we're here today. That's not why we're here today. <laughs> no, but it's all right. We want to hear but, what's... But, 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 quick, quick plug, quick plug. Let's... Here we go. Alan oh, shows we're yours, the original. We're doing original. that. There. We'll go quick plug. Do you have another plug there, Sean, or is that it? No. Uh, so why are we here today anyway? What's what's the uh, topic of uh, conversation? <laughs> what is there that? We go. You know what is that? We're, we're soon to be blessed. I think they're already starting the tour in a lot of places. We're going to soon receive Armored Saint and Todd Latore and our good friends Greensreich here in Montreal coming up. So we, Jimmy came up with this great idea of just, hey, since they're performing the EP and the warning, why don't we do a little flashback, flashback to the 80s and talk about the EP? Absolutely. A yeah, quick I plug, mean... they're in Illinois tonight, tomorrow, Indianapolis, Queens right and Armored Saint, then Kalamazoo. I always like that name, Kalamazoo in Michigan. Yeah. Detroit, Michigan. Cincinnati, Cleveland, then April 19th, Toronto, Canada. And then... Montreal, right after on the twentieth, oh, yeah. it's sold out. By the way, Montreal fans are going crazy over this. Of course, it's sold out. It's Montreal. It's Montreal, yeah. and then Kitchener on the twenty-first in Canada, and then uh, Pennsylvania, New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania again. All the dates are on QueensrikeOfficial dot com. I believe that's what the URL is. Sorry to cut everybody off, but I just want to do that quick. No, it's good. good. On the tour, right? Go get your tickets yeah, now. So December 2nd, 1983, this is what I purchased. And the, we were saying early, I you know, had just enough money to cover an album and just enough to, I think it was $3.99 was what this was listed at. I didn't have enough for a second album, so I had enough for the EP. And that's, we all landed up buying that, us and all our friends. And, and, and where did you buy it? I can't remember where I bought it, but... Uh, not rock on stock. Uh, I, I I bought a little known fact. I bought Ozzy Osbourne "Bark of the Moon" on the same day. So, oh, nice. <laughs> Queen of the Reich. Yeah, it's and all that, there. E EMI America. Th America. That so that's the second pressing. Yes, there was an independent pressing, right? Yeah. On uh, two oh six records out of Seattle. And you know how many they pressed? No. Should be a question. Thousand. Twenty thousand copies. All sold out. Yeah, Kerrang! No. Magazine went crazy on them, and next thing you know, they're signed to EMI. Yeah, so that was in 1982. They independently released the demos, the four, the sorry, not demos, but the songs for that album. Queens Reich, <laughs> the Lady Wore Black. I'm blacking Queen out. Queen of the Reich, yeah. Queen, 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 Queen of the Reich. Reich. Queen, Queen of the Reich. Reich. Sorry, the Lady Wore Black. Uh, Night Rider and Blinded. Night Rider and Blinded. See, I just I don't have to look at my notes. I don't have to look at my notes. Jeez, no, Jesus, all in the melon. Late, late summer, 1982. Exactly, Jim. Guys, I'll give you a preface to all this, and then Sean, you could tell us about your your feeling when you first bought this album. So you had the Mob, which was the core group without Jeff Tate, and then you had uh, Myth. Is it Myth? It was Myth yeah, right? More Rainbow Dio, uh, Deep Purple influenced, and. They asked Jeff, and so the story goes, and please correct me if I'm wrong. They asked Jeff, can you, they didn't have a singer. They played some gigs with him, but they didn't have an official singer. So Jeff goes with them to record these songs because he's never been in a recording studio before. And he goes, wow, it's a great experience, but I'm not going to quit myth. I'm not going to quit myth. So he does the songs as Alan showed us and told us the independently. It just took off, yeah. right? Okay. It just exploded. And they were managed by what was their name again? Jim and Diana Harris. 
who had a record store called Easy Street Records in Seattle. And they managed them. They changed their name from the mob because it was taken. And that was from the mob rules, by the way. They yeah. changed their name to Queen's Reich, which was the title track, Queen of the Reich. And it exploded so much so that Kerrang! Mag magazine did a write-up. Right, Alan, that you mentioned right, before? Right. Yeah. Then they did a, a showing with, uh, what do you call it, Sean? Not a showing, a showcase. A showcase. A showcase, a showcase. With okay. Zebra. Him, I loved him, signed him to a seven-album deal. Rumor has it that tickets uh, were very slow for the Zebra. And when the moment they put Queen Drake on for the opening act, it sold out. The venue sold out. So, Sean, you've been on major labels. What is it to be signed to a seven album deal? I mean, at least that's what I'm reading. I mean, maybe it was a fit five or six, but seven album deal. It's, 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 yeah, it's, I mean, you know, again, with the, I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, I'm sure you're, you're referencing that online. Um, it's definitely possible. But, you know, if that was the case, that's a great thing because of the continuity, you're know, knowing that they're going to be behind you, you know, even if, say, the first record was a flop or whatever, you know, nowadays you get dropped or whatever. But, you know, if they did have that many records uh, of, of a deal, that's a great thing, ultimately. Um, but, you know, I'm not really sure, that, to be honest. I never asked Whip. Yeah, that, that, would have been, you know, that would have been unheard of at the time, right? I well, they did open Rod's, for Twisted Sister, right? They, they went on they tour opened, with Twisted Sister. Now, they, they started with Quiet Riot, right, who was super yeah. hot at that time. And then did some uh, opening shows for Twisted Sister and Dio. Now, Sean's uh, slightly older than us. They played at the Spectrum here in Montreal with opening for Twisted Sister. Yep. And in the local paper, the Gazette, the next day, all they could talk about how was Queensryche blew Twisted Sister off the stage. Well, you know, that's... <laughs> that's a, that's subjective. That's a press. I, 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 you know, I don't know if anybody blows Twisted Sister off the stage. It, it, certainly in their heyday, those guys were, were on fire. But um, I mean, look, man, you know, I, I vividly remember I saw Queensryche in uh, 1986 for Rage for Order tour, open for Ozzy at, at the yeah. Forum. I was yeah, there as there. well. Yeah, we were all there. That, we were all there. And that show is on YouTube. And you talk about a band on fire. Jeff Tate was, I mean, he was on fire on that show. I, I still remember not even watching the, the YouTube stuff. And um, I just going, man, this, that he's such an amazing singer. Um, at, especially at that time with the EP. I mean, you know, you're talking 1982 here and, and certainly Halford was singing high stuff and Halford's one of the best singers in metal history, in my opinion, but Jeff Tate, man, I mean, when that, when that record came out, I mean, he, I, the vocals were so, the band is amazing, of course, but it, to me, if you inserted another singer in that situation, it wouldn't have had the same result. And to me, Jeff Tate really pushed it over the edge, in my opinion, in terms of just uh, stellar musicianship and just, you know, one of the best singers in metal history, in my opinion, certainly as Jeff Tate on those certainly on those earlier records. I mean, it got him. He was hard to match, man. He, he was just, you yeah. know, just brutal. Yeah, you, know? When, you know, when we first listened to it, especially Queen of the Reich, we were like, oh, okay, uh, America's answer to Iron Maiden, right? And that was, that was uh, my, my reaction. And uh, like Strange you said, enough, I never had that reaction, Alan. I never, I never said, uh, you know, these guys remind me of Maiden. I just, I don't know, I didn't hear it, but go ahead. No, that's it. I mean, Queen of the Reich itself, that song, uh, uh, like, like Sean said, the vocals on that. And, and you know, what's fun is, where I saw Todd's Creed's Reich open for the Scorpions, and he came out and he nails nails that whole song note for note. It just wow! I haven't seen that sung that way in, in decades. So uh, uh, yeah. it'll be interesting to see, interesting night to to hear that played uh, played again. So and again, and, and I, I'll, go ahead. And I will mention again, everyone: the tour is starting, and they're playing the whole EP plus Prophecy. And all of the warnings. So that's why it's called the Origins Tour. So go ahead, Sean. You know, we're, we, we're obviously talking a lot about the EP, which is a fantastic record. But my all-time favorite Queensryche record is the warning. So for them to do this, to play this record for the first time, and probably maybe the only time they'll ever do this, as it's, you know, uh, yeah. playing the warning and the EP in its entirety, 
which is reason right there why everybody should go see the show because they may not ever do it again. Um, that this got a, a great thing for me because that record holds such great memories. The, the warning record um, to me, it's such a heavy and very dark record in a lot of places, very um, dynamic. You know, it's not just like in your, you know, it's not just like Queen to the Right, just completing your face all the time. There's a lot of songs that have different kinds of uh, metal to it, which I really loved a lot. Um, to this day, I mean, really, that's my all time favorite Queen's Right record is The Warning. Of course, everybody loves Operation Mind Crime. That's an empire and all that stuff. But if you know, if you told me, asked me, what name your favorite all time Queens Rake record, and it's the Warning. So this this whole tour for me is a fantastic uh, opportunity for people to go check out the show. And again, you know, Todd just absolutely crushes it. I mean, you could not, in my opinion, you could not pick a better singer to uh, replace Jeff uh, in Queens Rake. I, I don't. There's guys who can do it. But Todd gets all the nuances and really goes that extra mile, in my opinion, to really try to nail it and uh, stay true to what the songs were. So I always give Todd kudos for that. Um, not because he's a good friend of mine. If he sucked, I would say he sucks. <laughs> and he knows that. <laughs> Todd knows that. No, I love Todd. And he's, I just think he's such a great singer. And this is just the perfect band for him. And uh it's great that uh, these guys are still killing it, man. You know, all these years later, they still love it, and uh, they're doing great. Sean, and, and he's still he's he's equal. Todd, what I like about Todd, especially, he's still a fan of the band, right? Yeah, he started absolutely. out as a fan of the band, so he enjoys singing these songs as much as we like listening to them. So, yeah, and that's a that's a big thing. I mean, that's we we share that similarity where you know the time that I spent in Megadeth, I was there over ten years, and you know, I, I love that band. So, you know, I didn't just join some band for a paycheck. It wasn't about that. That was all that other stuff was icing on the cake. Bottom line for me was I love that band. I've always loved Megadeth, especially the early stuff. So for me to be on stage playing Wake Up Dead and all the stuff that I grew up with and loved, oh, that cool. was a real special thing for me. And I know Todd feels the same way because, you know, he's such a, a big Queen's right fan. So, you know, that's, that's a, he's, in a, he's in a great spot. Yeah. Guys, when we take apart the songs on this EP, right? And you guys talked about the scream, right? That that first, the first note that Jeff Tate hits is, you know, some sort of high <laughs> note, but it's powerful, right? It's powerful note. And but what's amazing about Queen of the Reich, the song was written by DeGarmo. He says it was about some sort of nightmare he had. It's when you watch the music, have you guys seen the music video for this? Yeah. Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> it's interesting because. It starts off with, uh, you know, who is the Queen of the Reich? She is an evil adventurer who has enslaved the world after the Fourth Great War with an ancient computerized energy by a crystal <laughs> she found and declared herself Queen of the Reich. The only thing standing in her way are the five freedom fighters portrayed by the bad members. So even at the beginning, <laughs> even at the beginning, they were talking about computers and you're talking about like 1982 here, right? When they, they probably yeah. filmed this or 83. So even back then, they're talking about a world of today, I guess, in a way, right? So that's what that's what the allure of Queensbridge has always been, the vocals, the music, and the lyrical content that was always sort of interesting. That's what I want to say. And, and hey, you know what? Let's get Sean's opinion. I always, I enjoy Scott Rockenfeld. I think he's an unbelievable drummer on all the albums. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. Are you kidding me? Yeah. I mean, the guys... They all they all really inject yeah. their personalities into the music. It's not just a stock. He's not a stock drummer, or, or you know, there's. I can tell I can you know I can tell the difference between whip solos and the Garmo solos. Of course, I'm such a big fan of it. So over the years, you just you know you just adapt to it. But I mean, Scott Rockefeller. I mean, that guy was a big influence on me when I was when I was a, a teenager. You know, I mean, he's a fantastic drummer. But he didn't overplay. He certainly didn't underplay. I thought he's a very tasteful drummer and and. Uh, I mean, you know, again, a key component to that band, in my opinion, you put another drummer in there, you probably wouldn't get the same result. Plus, he was in, involved in other aspects of the band as well. Not, you know, I don't think he was, I don't think he was ever content just being the drummer. I think he was involved in a lot of different facets of the band back in the day. I don't know to what degree, but, you know, again, they're all super important. Uh, in my opinion, those five guys, I think if you inserted in another guy, I don't know if you would have got the same result, you know, but again, you know, of course 
like you suggest, you know, the scream at the beginning, Queen, Queen of the Right. I mean, it was just like, what a way to start a record, man. It was just, just brutal. Brutal, man. When you take the second song, right, Night Rider. Yep. And a lot of people say Dergarmo, Dergarmo, Dergarmo. But this is a Michael Wilton song, and Dergarmo yep. wrote the lyrics. So people yep. tend to forget that Michael Wilton was a huge contributor of the band, and even on the first right. EP, right? On every album. Yeah. On every album, yes. But I'm just saying, even from the beginning, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, and he's, you know, he's still with the band. A lot of people say, oh, they're a cover band, they're a cover band. But there are two core co-founders there who are, especially Michael Wilton, who's such a huge contributor, contributor to the legacy of the band. And I think Blinded, and actually, this is what I want to say about Blinded. I asked Todd, I go, Todd, are you going to hit that note at the end of Blinded? It might be one of the highest notes Jeff Tate has ever pulled off. <laughs> and he goes, every night I'm going to do it. Yeah, and if you watch some YouTube videos, he's freaking hitting it. And I could tell you right now, 100% certainty, he's not dialing it in. He's not faking it. He is pulling off that note. So if you want to go see Queensway, just go hear that one note he's pulling off live. That's what I want to say, unblinded. <laughs> Todd, oh, Todd, doesn't fake, Todd doesn't fake shit. Todd's the real deal. I mean, that's that's that note is F sharp or G standard tuning, if I if I remember right, and I know exactly what you're talking about the end of blinded. I think I think it's it's at least an F sharp uh, for all you geeks out there. Uh, so I mean, that's that's two it's notes. It's insane. Higher, that's two notes higher than the, the Queen of the Right stream, which is an E standard E tuning. Oh, so you know, yeah. I mean, no, Todd, so Todd, Todd, Todd can do it. He knows so, you af it. so after this video, everybody, go to YouTube, type in yeah. <laughs> Blinded, and go to the last part of the song where he hits that note. He does that live. Look, I don't want to jinx the guy here, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the pressure's on. Now. I don't want to jinx the metal him. voice is challenged. But him attempting it is 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 kudos to him for that, right? But you know, we were nice, we were lucky enough to to, to meet Michael Wilton, spend some time with him. And Jimmy, you know, you, you asked him, like, why, you know, maybe you need a PR agent you were teasing because nobody ever talks about Michael Wilton, the guitarist. And he's like, you just listen to all the albums that he's performed on and all his writing. And he, he's a heavyweight, man. He is. Yeah, he's, he's shy, that's well, like, why. He's, he's a quiet guy, that's why. You know, he's just, I, his it's role almost is like he, It's almost like he's the secret weapon, you know? I mean, yeah, everybody, yeah. like you said, like you suggest, everybody talked about, you know, DeGarmo Tate collaborations, blah, blah, blah. And they were really, if you, if you look at reference old videos, they were kind of the spokesman in a lot of interviews and all that stuff, which is fine. You know, the singer, main guitar player, main songwriter. But of course, Wilton was a, a very big contributing factor to a lot of that stuff. So just look, just because you don't tell everybody that you're, you're great or, you, you know, you, you know, he probably doesn't feel the need to have to, he knows what he did. So, you know what I mean? He's very unassuming, you know what I mean? He's a great guy and he's a great guitar player. So, you know. And again, I'll say this, on Blinded and on Knight Rider, Wilton collaborates with DeGarmo. He writes the music, DeGarmo right. does the lyrics. So right there, that's a testament to this EP, right? And yep. uh, the music they did. I don't even think he was 20, was he even 20 at the time? I don't, I bet you he wasn't even I don't think they were. The I don't think they were. I don't think yeah. they were. No. I mean, they're freaking kids, you know? Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. And they then you have the lady. The park. Alan, first time you heard the lady wore black. Oh, you don't want to do uh, Night Rider? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> go. I'm just. Uh, we skipped right over Night Rider. Okay. All right, right go Night Rider. Black. Sorry, we forgot Night Rider. Go, I, go, go. I mean, uh, yeah, the, those are the two standouts from Queen of the Rake and Lady Wore Black. And the rumor has it that they turned off all the lights in the studio and lit one candle to get that atmospheric vibe uh, when he when he recorded the vocals. And that's uh, obviously a Jeff Tate contribution on the album is a lady wore black and just the way it builds and starts slow. Like, like Sean me mentioned about the next album, the warning, there's a lot, you know, uh, starts uh, take hold of the flame and a few other songs. It starts much lower, much laid back. And then it builds to that big crescendo and probably a scream or two in there. And uh, I mean, this was a, a, a blueprint for the uh, songs to come. It was the blueprint for the whistle. The whistle. The whistle. Jeff Tate's first whistle because he whistles right okay. by, in error and they oh, left it yeah. on. I, I and then on the warning, he's got a whistle. And on Rage for Order, he's got a whistle. So it's the blueprint okay. for the whistle. Yeah. Right. You I guys mean, follow I what I'm saying? I didn't remember that. Yeah. Hmm. It's right at the beginning of Lady World War Black. Sorry. Alan, you want to go to Night Rider or what? That's yeah, funny. I mean, Night Rider. It's, it's, uh, I'll let Sean talk about Night Rider. 
It's just it's just a great tune. I mean, look, I mean, all all the tunes are great. Um, you know, Lady War Black is, is has a little more dynamics to it. You know, Queen of the Reich is just a sledgehammer to the face. I mean, that's what's great about the. You know, I mean, here's the question that I was going to ask you both, and I, I never asked Whip, which I really should have, but is why did they just do four songs? Why didn't they do do a full LP at the time? Okay. That's a good I would. I, I, it's a very good question. We should ask him. Because I would think who, it's, it's money. It was money. How many yeah. bands? How many bands back in the day? had their first record after they got signed being an EP. If you think about yeah. it, there's really not a ton. I mean, there's Wasp, Fuck Like a yeah. Beast, right? That that yeah. had four, did that three or, I think it had four. I can't remember. I think it had four yeah, yeah. songs. But there weren't many uh, debuts by a metal band at any point, really, that was a, was an EP. So that in itself is kind of a, a special thing, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, um, certainly put up by, you know, of course they got signed by EMI after the fact, but, you know, you just, I just kind of wonder why they didn't just do four more songs. Like, you know, take I, I could tell you, I, I could answer that question for you. After reading through the notes of all this album, they were basically using night hours in the studio. They were saving all their money from their jobs to create this, this, this demo. Right. I think it was just financial because back in the day when we were young lads, it was a fortune to work. To, to record something in a studio, right? And, yes, it was. And the quality of these songs have stood the test of time. Okay, it's not yeah. perfect, but man, the quality's there, right? Yeah, well, so it's not... It's the, probably... It's not neat records, right? It's, I mean, it's <laughs> EMI at the end of the day. That's and, right. Uh, you can tell a few of the new Wobbin bands, uh, it's, uh, it's hard to listen to them today with the production that was going on. And uh, we spoke about this to... Uh, to Jeff, even uh, you know uh, about being on EMI, who was, you know, I think this was their first foray into the heavy metal world back then. Was with Queens, right? You know, we got a lot of Atlantic and CBS records with Priest and and others, and but nobody was on EMI back then, and so they got a, a great a great push of major label right off right off the bat, and and, and the backing, like you said earlier, Jim, the backing to go along with it. So, and, and Alan, I think when we talked to D. Snyder, he told us here they were a struggling band to his sister. They're breaking, they're going, you know, they're working their way up, and then out comes the limo and Queens. Right, they've already got the opening slot on a tour, like they haven't done. And I think that tour with Twisted Sister was actually their first proper tour minus a few club dates they probably did at the start right so i think they, they did really, quite, my note says said they did quiet ride just before maybe it was quiet ride right before yeah yes. down in louisiana yes. baton rouge i don't know how, yeah. how yeah. many dates they did but uh but but having what you guys just said they if you think about it they really beat the system didn't they like you referenced twisted sister who literally slugged it out in the clubs for 10 years before before they really hit with yeah. with the hungry record you know and Queensryche didn't have to do that at all. They just, they put out an EP, they got signed and wow, and now we're playing with Quiet Riot, we're playing with, you know what I mean? It just shows you the power of, of signing with a, a, a big label and that has that push and, and can get you to the right places. I mean, they really, if you think about it, they really did beat the system in terms of not having to slug it out for six years and driving separate cars and not sleeping all that garbage, you know what I mean? Of course that, yeah. There, there is a, I, I suppose back in the day, there's probably a, a bit of romanticism about it, you know, but probably not a whole lot. You know what I mean? Going through that crap, I'm sure is not a, a fun thing at any time point, you know, but uh, yeah. they really did beat the system in terms of not having yeah. to plug it out in the clubs to get a name. And I you didn't think about it at the right? time. But, oh, yeah, I didn't think about it at the time, but looking back, releasing uh, a less expensive because it's an EP, to get a taster, a feel for the band, that set the set the the path to when the warning came out to have major sales with the warning at following it because it was a taster for for uh, you know guys that didn't have a lot of money. We, we, nobody was working. We're all still in high school. Three ninety nine. Uh, you know, we were Jesus. I don't know. I even know how I got all my money. To, nothing illegal, but it's a miracle that I was able to spend uh, buy an album a week back then. So you yeah, know, I, I think it was I a think... great marketing ploy. I agree. I, I, I'm pretty sure I picked up the album at Rock on Stock before the warning came out. But there was this buzz, I guess, in all the hip raiders and circus magazines. And there was this big, big buzz. And you, and 
And I would just see pictures. I didn't know what the music... They didn't play it on the radio, did it? They didn't play it on the Metal Files. I don't think they played Queensryche. That's before the Metal File. That was before the Metal Files. Yeah, right? yeah. That was no- 85, 86. Around. And I'm yeah. pretty sure I bought it right, just basically on the articles in the mags, right? In the magazines. And, yeah. and just the buzz. And I'm pretty sure my buddy Ron, he had that EP before I had it. And he played it to me. I was like, what? And then the warning came out. That I was like, oh my God, what's going on here? Yeah. Well, it was always in your face and it was at a, a reasonable price. So like I said, we had just enough money to buy it. Then then you listen to it. And I mean, you're like, oh, wow. When is their next album coming out? You know, everybody landed up buying it after a while. So listen to this. Chad, who's on the chat here. I grew up in Tacoma, Washington. I remember when they first hit a local radio station, played Lady Wear Black and it blew up. So there you go. There was the massive sold, yeah. buzz. There was a timing thing too, right? Iron Maiden were taken off. You know, Judas Priest were taken off. 82. Why right? Riot, don't forget. Why Riot were taken right? off. And 82, 83 was mass. And then it was the right band with the right songs, with the right voice at the right time. And there you go, right? They, I, I wouldn't say they rolled away, but I said they broke out. They broke out big time. Now, Yeah, they didn't. Know, they don't think they rode any wave because really it was still it was it was hap- like you suggest it was happening really starting to happen around like you said 82 was screaming for vengeance number of the beast all that you know scorpions blackout all that stuff and you know a lot of the metal bands were really starting to make serious headway and play the arenas and all that stuff and, and they definitely jumped on that which is great it was just great like you said great timing but it all starts and stops with you got to have the songs and you got to have the right. right singer. You get you know, and they had all. It was just again, I think it was a great timing thing for them, you know. And and the the, the EP was the catalyst for all of that. But the warning right. to me, the, you know, without the EP, they don't have anything. But the warning to me took it to the next level. The songs, in my opinion, are more mature. They're just it's just a great dark, heavy record, dynamic record. And it's, you know, it's, it's Sean, Sean, when you think about this album, okay. And you think about Europe and power metal Mm -hmm. in a way, this is kind of like Iron Maiden and Queens, right? We're the blueprint of the whole European power metal scene and even the U S power metal scene. Uh, I'm trying to think of, is there any other band in 82, maybe riot, but they weren't power metal yet. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. They weren't yeah, power right. metal yet. They were still like no, no. They, they had they had red horse around around that time. Yeah. You know, that's, that's right. Not, that was not power. That's not power metal at that point at all. But for U.S. for the U.S. right, I think they were the blueprint for U.S. power metals because I think Crimson Glory was after they were. Right? Oh yeah, Crimson Glory. Crimson Glory was four or five years yeah. after that. Yeah, yeah. the first yeah. record didn't come out. I think to eighty seven. If I if memory serves, I don't think the first Crimson Glory didn't come out to eighty seven ish. I think only Dio would compete, but even Dio wasn't the same sound. I find Dio another. another You got to remember, as you know, there was no quote unquote power metal back then. All these stupid terms came into play later, right? You know, we all three of us know, you know, (laughs) we don't say, oh, Queen's Rack is, it's metal, dude. There was rock, hard rock, and there was metal at that time, right? All these And Jethro Tull. (laughs) <laughs> we'll always win the, the metal Grammy, but you know what I mean? You know, we didn't have those tags back then. And, and I, to me, that's, it's still quite silly in a way with a lot of that stuff, because it's very, to me, it's very limiting. Right. Cause when you say, well, what do they sound like? What kind of music? Like, oh, they're power metal. And right. If you don't like power, metal, like, oh, they suck. I'm not even going to listen to them. It's like, instead of saying, yeah, dude, they're a good metal band. Check them out. And then yeah. you have a little bit more of an open mind. Like we did now. It's just like, Oh, they suck because they're this, or they suck because they're they're symphonic death chord, whatever. You know what I mean? I find it really it's humorous, but at the same time, it's very sad in my opinion because you're, you're a lot of times people won't even give you a chance based on what someone else categorizes that band as, right? It's just so, it's the way of the world and whatever. But I, I and it, back so then, there, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, back then there was no there was no power metal, but you know, like you guys suggest. That was definitely a precursor to what would become the Halloweens and all the, you know, the Stradivariuses and all those other, you know, great uh, power metal bands that came later. Certainly 
the Queens Rec EP would have to be a reference point for that. I would, I would think. Frank, Frank Potvin makes a good point. Agent Steel, Warlord. Uh, I don't know. Was was Agent Steel? I think it was. They were eighty three. I don't know if they were eighty two. I could be wrong. Please correct me. Omen, no way. Omen was not a power metal band. No, they were no, more. They were, they're more like a new wave of British heavy, heavy metal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're they're more of a new album band for sure. Yeah, I mean, you can again, you can argue that fact now, right? Forty yeah. years later, yeah. That song is uh, it, no, but you know the all, sound on this album. I don't think you, you 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 didn't hear this specific sound anywhere else. Maybe right. heard parts of it. This is not Judas Priest. In my opinion, Iron Maiden's always been galloping, dual guitar harmonies. Bruce kind of sang in the same register as Jeff Tate, but Jeff Tate was doing these gymnastics that Bruce Dickinson wasn't doing. I mean, he was going all the way low to all the way high. Bruce, so. uh, Bruce was a uh, powered. But uh, what I take away is, you know, back in that time, you had the West Coast, right? The Quiet Riot, the Motley Crues, the Dawkins, the Rats. And then you had the New York scene, right? With the perhaps Manor War, Twisted Sister, definitely Riot when they weren't bankrupt. Uh, and, and, and then Queensway comes along from Seattle. And you're like, well, I always linked them more towards the, the British scene at that time than, than what was happening yep. in the American. Yep. Absolutely. If you didn't tell if you didn't say where they were from, they you could have said they're definitely from England or they're from Germany or from you know what I mean? They sound Europe in my opinion, I, I agree. They they sounded very European, those certainly those yeah. first two records. You know, they're from Bellevue, Washington. I mean, they just came out of nowhere. You know what I mean? Again, it's just I think it's a matter of Right place at the right time, right guys in the band. It just all is just just a real timing thing. But again, the, it all starts and ends with if, if the songs aren't there and the musicians aren't there, we wouldn't be we're here right now talking about it forty two years yeah. later. But, and it, it, it took you know. them a while the the four the four guys to find a singer. When they finally did, he was non committed. And then he when he heard oh you got a contract well maybe I'll you got some studio time I'll jump on board. And then the rest as they say is history. So. Yeah, you know a, a funny fact or fun fact I should say is the prophecy. A lot of people think yeah. that the prophecy was actually on the original EP, which Alan was holding up before. Prophecy was just added on in 1986. This is a song that they were playing in their between the EP and the Warning era. They're playing yeah. it. They're performing. I think live in Tokyo '84. Yeah. They actually played that song. However, it was not on this album. It was only on the re-release. In 1986, and then again, this I think was the 1990 version when the whole all the you know the live tracks and all that. So this is like the remaster of the remaster. But yes, the prophecy was not on the original EP. A lot of people think it was. It was a song from that era, but it was never on the original one. So here's here's a question for you both. You may or may not know this. Actually, I'm not 100 sure as well. Is what? At what point did they record Prophecy? Was it during the warning sessions or was it during the Rage for Order sessions? Ra Rage for Order, they recorded the Prophecy. Yep. Yeah. That's yeah. That is correct. You can tell Being, by the production. You can tell by the production <laughs> of the song if you're, if you're prone but to... to it, it's to interesting record. because the production sounds like the warning, but the song structure sounds more like... Sorry, the song production sounds like Rage Against... Uh, Rage... Rage... Rage against order. the machine. <laughs> rage for order. <laughs> sounds like rage for order. Next week. But the song itself sounds like it would have belonged on the EP or the warning. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And it was written by Lisa. It's a great Delgado, song. So. It's a great song. You know, I'm glad that they. I'm glad that they were smart enough to record it and and put it on the re-release because it's a it's a great song. So I interesting. Also, during their EP, they're playing the EP and the warning, right? They will be including the prophecy as part of the EP oh, wow. on their set. So they're yeah, they they, they 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 should because it's a great song. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So and a lot of people, like you said, a lot of people don't have the original four song EP on vinyl. They don't have it. They think that prophecy is has always been on it. And that's not true. But so it's a great thing that they are playing it. Yeah, Alan's got the four. EMI version. Only four. Only four. Alan's got the EMI version. You got the the second pressing. Well, maybe the first pressing with EMI, not the first pressing with EMI. Yes, yes. But uh, I love seeing this. This album is going like used for like thirty or forty bucks now in the used record store. So that's that's nice to see on a three dollar investment. So 
Yeah. Yeah. You just, you just, uh, you just made what a thousand percent profit. If you sold yeah. that. Yeah. But like my friends always joke. Yeah. But you're not getting rid of them. We'll, we'll bury your albums with you. So, uh, when yeah. you die, so no matter what it's worth, it's staying here. Guys, a, another yeah. fun fact, uh, Jeff Tate only wrote the lyrics to the lady wore black. That was the only, his only contribution, of course, the vocals, right. On, on the other songs, but you know, his only contribution was the lyrics to the lady wore black, but it, it's a testament to Jeff. That's a great <clears throat> dynamic song. And that could have been on the warning also, right? That, that's, and that's we, we had the, the pleasure of interviewing Jeff numerous times, meeting him. Always like the gentleman. time when you couldn't get the camera working. Yeah, yeah, that was a classic. <laughs> but always a gentleman, always a super nice guy. I mean, I and again, uh, even, uh, you know, Todd's always had a good relationship to him. He was telling us he's got nothing against Jeff and, Hopefully it's vice versa. I think they've, they, that's, that's uh, settled a long time ago. And, uh, and, you know, we've, we've had nothing but nice things to say about Jeff Tate. I mean, he's always been a, a big uh, help for us here at the metal Voice. So. Yeah. I mean, you know what? And, and I even Todd, you know, he fell in love with the band. Like we fell in love with the band. Right. Yeah. And he's an extension now to the band. He's, you know, the continuation of the band. And I think going to see, the EP and all of the warning, I think it's 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 probably one of the, the best shows of 2024 for me. And seeing Armored Saint. Armored Saint, what a bonus. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sean, are they passing by Atlanta? Or are they already passed by there? Yeah. No, they did not. They're coming uh, in uh, early May. Okay. All right. Yeah. They're one of the last stops in the tour before they, they finish down in Florida, if memory serves. I think they have three or four shows in Florida, and that's where they're going to end the tour. So yeah, they come; they're dropping by Atlanta uh, right before that. So, yeah, so there's I mean, three Canadian dates. There's Toronto on the 19th, right? So go get your tickets now. Montreal sold out. You got to go to Scalpers or something. I don't know what you got to do. And uh, Kitchener, Canada, the uh, the home of Helix is Helix there, Alan Kitchener, right? Helix is there. Are they, from Kitchener, are, they from, are they from London? Are they Kitchener or London, Ontario? I Kitchener think, and London's pretty close, aren't they? Yeah, I thought They're it was London. This is a, when we interviewed him, he was in London. I don't, his house was in Or London. maybe Kitchener is Razor. I think, uh, yeah, yeah, Kitchener is Razor. There's some bands. Kit, Kit, Kitchener, is, uh, Kitchener is Razor. Razor. That's I think right. London London's, uh, is west of Toronto, right? Going towards... Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, I think I think if I'm not 100 percent tr- sure, but I think that uh, uh, Volmer's is from London, uh, Ontario. I think, I think, I, I think that's where he is now. I don't. Uh, that's definitely where he, he's he's at. He's he's. I think he was in Florida. Later phases of his, his career. He's got a, he's got a house down. He's got a place down in Florida too. I think he bounces back and forth. Yeah, good yeah. for him. Yeah. All right, guys. I think. All let right. Me just, I'll, let me read out the dates one last time, and we'll yeah. wrap it up. We'll Someone wrap it up. Promote. <laughs> Ron Sad says, "Ron Sad here. See you there, Jim." It was Ron Sad who's actually texting me that I think he played me this EP before I actually went to get it. So, Ron, hats off to you. April tenth, Illinois. April twelfth, Indianapolis. April thirteenth, Kalamazoo. The zoo. <laughs> You know, like the scorpions. Okay. Uh, Detroit, April 14th. April 16th, Cincinnati. April 17th, Cleveland. Toronto, 19th. Montreal sold out. 20th. 21st, Kitchener. Uh, McKee's Rocks, Pennsylvania. I don't know where that is, but I guess it's somewhere. Mm -hmm. Albany, New York. Close to Montreal, too. Worcester, Massachusetts. That's Massachusetts, Worcester? Worcester. 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 I'll kill you. Like Worcester. I'll kill you if you say it that way down there. They'll find you and kill you if you mispronounce yeah. those words up there. Yeah. New, New Haven, Worcester. Connecticut, Sayreville, Sayreville, New Jersey. Sayreville. Yeah, yeah. Sayreville, yeah. And Glenside, Pennsylvania. And that's it, guys. All right. Razor was formed in Guelph, but very healthy metal scene here in Kitchener, Waterloo region. So, Frank, you're in Kitchener. I think you're in Kitchener. You got to go see uh, Queensryche. Guys, thank you very much. Sean. Hey, Sean. Withering Scorn. Pleasure. Withering Good, Scorn. Yeah. Well, you'll, you'll, be more about that. you'll be hearing more about that later on. We'll, we'll, uh, 
we can reconvene at a later date about all that stuff. Yeah, we will. We oh, will. Thanks, well, we'll thanks to, for we'll having me. We'll have to, do, we'll have to do the warning. We'll have to do the warning next. Oh, yeah. we got to do the full the full version of the warning, but not, not yet. Not a bad song. Not a bad song on that album. That, that album's perfect from start to finish. Yeah. Flat out. All right. All Always right. a pleasure, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Good thanks to so see much. you.